just moved. All right. Hi. All right. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're really excited and honored to have Sarah Ashmi here to tell us about her, her living history. In the interest of time, I will pass it on directly to her to, to give us a, her story. Thank you so much for the invitation. And first of all, happy birthday. Um, I love it that you guys have been doing this for three years. Uh, and thank you. Uh, thank you for including me. So I am starting my story just to tell you a little bit about who I am as an academic and how I got to where I am. So after college, I um, had the good fortune of joining the Waits Lab for about a year. And it was really the exper experience of, of working with Dave um, and working with his group was really what sold grad school for me, for instance, and, and told me that I really wanted to go on and do science at the time I wasn't really convinced. Uh, but the thing that I really loved about my time at the soft, soft matter lab was uh, that the research was really visual, really visual appealing, visually appealing. And also I could really think about what's happening in my everyday life Right? We had somebody working with toothpaste, and lots of people working with cells. Um, I could think about real world phenomena, not just like low temperature, hard condensed matter physics that I couldn't really grasp um, intuitively. So I had a great time there. That led me to grad school at Yale. Whoops. Um, and after, after grad school, I, so I got my PhD in 2008. I did a postdoc and this image has nothing to do with biology, but I had a very long postdoc where I looked at asphaltines, which are a component of petroleum. For this community, the only thing I'll say about asphaltines is this is what the molecule looks like. It's this really conjugated, highly conjugated, very aromatic, um, high stacking molecule that leads to lots of instabilities. It makes colloids that self-assemble, then they aggregate and they form larger things and they eventually clog. And so this was one of the things I was looking at in as a postdoc was to figure out understanding the kinetics and the dynamics and the self-assembly of this process and then how to arrest it or how to uh, arrest it at various stages. Uh, so that was really interesting. I got to take my colloid background and apply it to something totally different. Um, and I really had a great time actually. At the beginning, it was difficult learning, like Savash had said previously, learning a new language, right? Learning a new field. Um, but then I stayed at Yale as so my postdoc ended and had uh, was able to found a instrument facility, a small instrument facility, but light scattering. And this came about simply very organically. We had a lot of, I had a lot of collaborators asking for my help with light scattering. We had some really uh, successful collaborations and it was clear to me that there was enough need across the university for a small instrument core. And so we, we approached the provost uh, put this together, and I was director of this facility for several years. Um, and then I joined Northeastern in 2019, and I run the Complex Fluids Lab. And this is kind of our lab logo. Um, if I have the chance, I will show you something briefly about what it is that we do. But everything that we do is flowing soft materials through small spaces. That's kind of our, our motto. And lots of our uh, lots of our projects are inspired by things that happen in blood flow. So we don't really use exactly the biological materials, but we want to understand uh, the flow fundamentals and the processes that happen. So, whoops, once again. And I kind of love it that my uh, academic journey has been uh, fairly building on itself. So I don't know where I can go from here, but okay. Um, so I won't say too much about this slide. This is just kind of blowing up the previous slide of our motto and just telling you Briefly, some of the things that we do, the most biologically relevant, we think about uh, bacteria flowing in microchannels. We think about occlusion and gelation and flow, things that might happen in, in blood clots, for instance. Um, one thing I love about our research currently, again, is very visual. So we've got polymers cross-linking and depositing and wiggling and flow here. We've got uh, granular material, and this is colloids clogging in, in micropores. Um, again, I won't linger here too long. I'll be happy to take questions later. But um, but to me, our science is visually engaging and we do fundamental research and we're really interested in, in thinking about real world problems on, on many different scales. 
Um, so just to tell you a little bit about my 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 geographical path, right? Um, so I was uh, born in a small town called Sinsbury, Connecticut, and there's very few reasons you would know about my town, um, but it's it's part of uh, the Farmington Valley, and there's a beautiful ridge that we call it a mountain, but it's really only like 200 feet tall. It's very tiny, um, but overlooking the valley, and it's just beautiful and kind of uh, looking back on it, kind of idyllic. Um, we have this hilarious farm in town that many years ago got around the regulations for no advertising larger than a certain size by putting their ad for eggs backwards. Um, <clears throat> so this is very recognizable. I even saw somebody wearing a t-shirt. I was at some event in New York and it had this eggs logo on it. I'm like, I know exactly where you got that t-shirt from. So this is something very recognizable for my town. And we also brag about having the largest tree in Connecticut um, in our town, um, named after our uh, American environmentalist, naturalist, Pincho. So, okay, this is where I grew up. Didn't go very far for college and then to work in the weights lab. And then I bounced back to New Haven. Um, people know a lot about Boston, I suppose. Uh, New Haven has a lot of really charming things about it, especially one thing I didn't know before I got there, this like rock that just like juts out of the um, juts out of the landscape right north of the university and has this beautiful view over the whole town. It's just fantastic. Um, and then, you know, bouncing back to, to Boston. Um, so my, uh, my, my, the places I've lived don't look like they're too far flung from each other. But um, one of the things that's fantastic about academia, of course, is that we can sort of go all over. And this is not necessarily the places, list of places I've been in, in total, it's just the list of places that I've been for academic purposes and um, and there's more to come. And, and, I, and I love that we can travel domestically, internationally for conferences, short courses to, to visit colleagues. Um, and I look forward to more of that. And I don't wanna go too long. I think I'm doing okay on time so far. Um, I did have some thoughts I wanted to share. Ah. Uh, this is, you know, advice that you can take it or leave it. Some of the things that I found to be most important in my career trajectory uh, has really been interactions with people, not just mentors, but also mentees and colleagues. And I think for me, this is one of the things that has really, really driven me to just continue uh, where I am and to continue with my science. And it's been interesting for me to look back on my trajectory and realize how many of my steps really hinged on a single conversation with a single person. It's really kind of amazing me, to me to think about this. Um, like working with, with Dave for that one year, I spent a half an hour in his office as I was finishing college, not knowing what I was gonna do. Um, and we just talked and he gave me some options, things I could think about. And then he emailed me later on that summer. and was like, I've got some, some small amount of funding. Why don't you come and spend a year with me doing a post back research. And it was just amazing and life-changing and, and really came out of just one conversation. Um, and my postdoc happened the same way and it, just lots of things. I, I feel like we can't take for granted the importance of a single conversation, whether it's with one of our mentors or one of, with one of our mentees uh, that we can really, really help to shape someone else's life. Um, and that kind of goes along with thinking about how you communicate with people for me as a, as a mentor now, I feel like I wanna to try to be clear with my students about expectations, um, but then also encourage them with our lab culture, letting them know it's okay to fail or okay to try new things and hopefully being enthusiastic about ideas that they have. And then gratitude here um, is the thing that I try to fall back on when I'm having the tough days, right? Like the days that you just are overwhelmed with everything, feeling behind on everything and just realizing like, this is what I wanted to do. And I'm finally here in this position where um, I get to be doing every day for work what I had really been aiming for. Uh, that final bullet point, some important things, everything else, like that's a question mark, right? It's up to you to decide what else is important. I think for me, really the the frame of mind is the thing that helps me you know get through get through the rough times and then hopefully uh focus on the good things and the things that we like to do with our science and 
and working with our students. And just along those lines, uh, this is one of my, I believe the next slide is, oh, whoops, I'm gonna skip that. Oh no, there it is. Um, this is one of the acknowledgement slides I use and um, I've only been at Northeastern about four years. I've got four grad students and many more undergrads that are in this picture. And then I've had one postdoc and I'm just really grateful for, for my group and the culture that we've put together um, in the lab. And I think I'm just at about 10 minutes, but I guess this final slide was a shameless plug. Uh, Northeastern is a fantastic place. We are hiring if anybody in the audience is looking for academic faculty position. Um, our department is incredibly diverse. We've got lots of overlap with lots of biological problems and we've got also some materials. Um, and of course, Boston, poor seasons, lots to say there. Um, but thank you all for your time and I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk with everyone. And I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Sarah. That was fantastic. Um, so I have, a, I have a question for you in the interest of time, I'll just get, get grab one from the chat. Um, so your your talk highlighted a sense of humor in, in many different contexts. Um, could you possibly share some ways in which the sense of humor can help tide over difficult or awkward moments in academic contexts? Um, you know, it's funny you say that. I feel like it's something that I have grown into. I feel like I didn't have the same sense of humor, you know, X number of years previous, but it's really something that as I've gotten a little bit more comfortable in the position where I am now, um, yeah, I feel like I can try to take things a little bit more lightheartedly. One of the things that, um, one of the stories I love to share, one of my students has young kids and also uh, young nieces and nephews like a lot of us have. And he explains to the young kids in his life that what he does is he pushes jello through a straw, right, for his work. And to me, like, that's just this fantastic example that you can relate to a five-year-old, right? Everybody knows what jello is. And so to me, to make things relatable with other people, despite their background or despite their age, um, has been has been really important. And again, trying to think about these things, you know, a little less seriously sometimes is something I've tried to grow into so far. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much.